good afternoon and welcome um, to the seminar, which is a joint seminar by the uh, Research Center Digital Futures at Work um, um, at the University of uh, Sussex, Leeds, and also with the affiliation with Cambridge and the CBR here in Cambridge. Um, I also realized I need to introduce myself. I've been here, I think Simon and I, we just talked 20 years ago the first time. I'm Matthias Siems, I'm an associate here at the CBR, and I'm at the moment also a professor um, in Florence in Italy at a place called European University Institute. Um, and it's my great pleasure to um, um, chair um, today's seminar um, on the title, What has been happening to labor laws around the world? New evidence from the CBR um, LRI dataset. Um, and you have the uh, list of uh, authors here, and I think Simon Deacon will start um, with the presentation, and then some of his co-authors um, will come in as well, and afterwards we have time for Q&A. Then I would just say, um, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Good afternoon, everybody um, in the room and online. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to begin the presentation. Uh, before handing over firstly to Twisha Schroff, and then uh, after Twisha has presented, uh, she'll hand over to Bumika Villa. Uh, after Bumika, Louise Bishop will speak, and then I'll come back. So the main purpose of today's presentation is to uh, present the new 2023 update of the uh, CBR LRI index. Uh, and this is a, an index that we've been working on here in Cambridge uh, as Matthias uh, and I both know, for nearly 20 years, like, we began working on this. Um, and we've just updated the CBR LRI to the end of 2022. So we now have a further decade of data. And the main purpose of today's uh, seminar is to present the new data that we've got um, from the latest update. Um, so, let's see, yes. Um, I'm gonna begin by saying something about the origins, function and scope of the data set. The research question which we're addressing is this, uh, what are the social and economic effects of labor laws? And more specifically, do labor laws end up harming the workers they're designed actually to protect, as suggested influentially by the World Bank in its doing business report of 2008. When we first began to do this research, um, the idea of getting a statistical measure of legal texts was comparatively new. Without such a measure, it's very difficult to answer the research question, what are the effects of labor laws? It's possible to do case studies, it's possible to look at history and also to do qualitative interview-based research. Those are all things we have done in, in our own research here at the CBR. But getting a measure across countries and over time, which is a reliable statistical account of what's happening to the law um, requires methodological innovation and the construction of new data sets. When this debate began um, in the uh, mid 2000s, the legal origins uh, literature was at its peak. And coming out of that legal origins debate were papers, including the one by Juan Botero et al, published in 2004 in the Quarterly, of Jour Quarterly Journal of Economics, The Regulation of Labor. Um, which introduced so-called uh, lexymetric uh, coding methods into this field. Although those authors didn't call it that, uh, they found a way to translate legal texts into a numerical form that could then be used in econometric analysis. And this involves a careful reading of the text and the translation of the text into, into a, sometimes a binary, sometimes a graduated variable using data coding techniques, which we've come to call lexymetric. Um, the original Botero et al. paper went on to inspire the World Bank's doing business reports. There had already been the OECD employment protection indicators uh, going back to the 1990s. They provided a measure of dismissal law protection in OECD countries that proved to be influential. The OECD in the 1990s, its jobs report, was making the case for labour market flexibility uh, and in essence uh, saw employment protection laws as rigidities and potential distortions of employers' hiring decisions. The World Bank added to this the idea that regimes deriving from regulation and from institutions might make it more or less easy for businesses to start up. So here began the doing business agenda. And again, labor laws were presented as potential distortions or rigidities 
behind this was an economic theory that at least if the market for labor is in equilibrium, law externally intervening in hiring decisions and in the way that terms and conditions were formulated could induce distortions. If the labor market is in equilibrium, then protecting workers over and above contractual provisions might introduce distortions. There might be higher unemployment because the cost of hiring labor is now artificially high. There might be disincentives for investment and potential disincentives also for innovation because labor laws might be making the business climate less certain, especially for high-tech firms. On the other hand, uh, many theorists today from an institutional perspective and also from the perspectives of a comparative political economy and certainly new law and political economy would not accept that the labor market is in some kind of natural equilibrium before the law intervenes. Labor laws play a, a, a really important role in creating labor markets, bringing them into existence in the first place by providing a basis for the commodification of labor or labor power. When labor laws do that, when they introduce fairness into the fundamental contractual form of the employment relationship, they are of course there to protect workers against arbitrary dismissal, against health and safety risks, against risks arising from their wage dependence, their vulnerability in what is a highly asymmetric um, relationship. Employers generally have power. Workers don't always have that power. Adam Smith recognized this before Karl, Karl Marx did. J.M. Keynes recognized it. Right? So the employment contract is not a regular contract and the labor market is not a completely normal or regular market. Fairness um, today, Thanks to behavioral economics and new institutional economics, it is recognized that fairness plays a crucial role in mitigating uncertainties and asymmetries, which can be a barrier to what is sometimes called in the institutional literature, optimal contracting. So labor laws are there to protect workers first and foremost, and not necessarily to induce greater efficiencies, but they can lead to improvements in productivity and also to a more cooperative work environment and especially in high-tech sectors, there may be a need for this form of regulation whereby employers can use employment law to make it more straightforward for them to make a credible commitment to co-share the results of innovation. Because ultimately those employers critically depend upon their workforce for information flows and for vital skills, firm specific human capital, tacit knowledge that workers have, employers also need. So the economic debate has been in flux all this time. The initial empirical studies didn't really show many positive labor law effects, but we were concerned, as were other researchers, that these indices were not capturing all the features of labor law that we thought were important. So around about 2005, 2006, the CBR got funding to look into this question from the ESRC. Um, and with Matthias and with Priya Lely, I wrote a paper in 2007, The Evolution of Labor Law, applying uh, what Matthias in a separate paper termed lexymetric data coding methods, initially to five countries. So what's now a data set with over 100 countries began with only five. And the ILO, through its International Labour Review, supported our work from an early stage. Uh, a version of this paper was published in ILR. And later on in 2015, we contributed data for a chapter in the World Employment and Social Outlook Report on the economic effects of labour laws, which the ILO published. In 2016 to 17, there was a the first publication of the CBR LRI dataset with a global reach. So at that point, we had over 100 countries and um, nearly 50 years. 2023 update now provides 53 years worth of data from 1970 to the end of 2022. We still have those 117 countries which we have coded. We have five sub indices and 40 individual indicators. Tricia will explain more about the methodology but essentially we have 40 individual variables which capture rules about labor law, ranging from, as categorized by the sub-indices, the rules about different forms of employment, part-time work, temporary work, and fixed-term work, and that overlaps with platform work and gig work in today's economy. Rules on working time, limits to the working week, uh, annual paid holidays, public holidays. Dismissal protection, laws about the termination decision, unfair or unjust dismissal, how far does the law require the employer to act fairly at the point of discipline and termination in relation to employment? Employee representation, freedom of association, the right to form a trade union, the right to collective bargaining. Also co-determination, 
So collective employee representation, both through collective agreements between trade unions, employers and employers associations, but also co-determination, joint management and worker decision-making, both in the workplace, through the Works Council, and also at board level through corporate co-determination. And finally, laws on industrial action and the right to strike. Year coverage, 1970 to 2022, the 117 countries we've coded are those for which we have access to laws going back to the 1970s. So there's a data issue with some countries. Um, it's difficult to code every country in the world that are over 300, but the nearly 120 that we have coded represent 95% of world GDP. We have written a code book which explains in detail what the coding protocols are that we have used to do the coding. We have also produced a data set and online, um, um, the link is contained later in this slide. You can see the updated data set and the code book, which explains how we did the coding for every single value in the data set. There were a quarter of a million individual observations in the data set. Um, the code book explains the basis for each one. So what I can show you here on the left-hand side of this slide is first of all, the coding protocol for one of the variables, which is concerned with whether fixed term workers have the right to equal treatment with workers employed permanently. And beneath that, there is part of the code book for France, where we explain how we coded a particular law in France from 1970 onwards, variable five. On the right-hand side, you can see the data as they're presented in the Excel spreadsheet, which is online, and the codings translate from the code book into the data set, as you can see. And this is the research tool we make available to uh, everyone to use. The data set has always been publicly available, and this 2023 update is available online um, as of this morning. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand over to Tuisha to say a bit more about our methodology. She's online, so I'm gonna stand up here and move the slides on, but over to you, uh, Tuisha. Hi, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tuisha Shroff, and I'm a PhD candidate at the law faculty, uh, working on my thesis under Simon's supervision. And I'm going to be touching upon a few methodological issues involved in the construction of lexymetric indices in general, and the CBR LRI in particular in my presentation. So let me get started straight away with the next slide uh, about this. Um, so on this slide, I've presented uh, two questions uh, to you as the audience. Uh, why measure the law or labor law? And is the law simply too complex a concept to be quantified? Now, depending on uh, your background or where you're coming from, these questions are either <laughs> extremely, extremely banal or, or they're extremely important questions. Uh, so if you're a social scientist who regularly um, you know, engages with quantitative uh, indices or quantitative work, uh, these questions may be banal. So I'll ask you to please bear with me till I get to the good part. Um, if you're a labor lawyer, and I think a lot of us in this room are labor lawyers, uh, then these are really important questions um, because it's not quite obvious why we should measure the law and uh, why the law is not too complex an issue to be quantified. So um, let, me, let me start with the first one, and Simon has touched upon this already, so I'll try to be brief. Why measure the law and why measure labor law? As Simon said, there are questions, important questions around the socioeconomic effects of labor law being asked. Do labor laws in fact support worker productivity? Do labor laws, strong labor laws tend to retard uh, employment and retard uh, economic growth? And these are questions that policymakers are very interested in and they are questions that they want answered with evidence. And as Simon said, the World Bank and the OECD have engaged in providing this evidence before, and uh, the answers may not be, uh, you know, those that labor lawyers like to hear. Those answers have been, uh, you must deregulate your labor laws because they're in fact hurting the workers that they're meant to protect. So if we as labor lawyers want to engage meaningfully with this debate, I would submit that we do need to engage with the methodology with which labor law is being reduced to quantitative indicators. And the second reason uh, we should measure the law, and it's going to be addressed later in this presentation, is that to see trends across 117 countries, as this data set allows us to see, or to see trends across 55 years, 
uh, is not something that we can get to very easily through legal analysis. You can you can read the text of the laws for 117 countries, and you can try and read those texts for 55 years. But you know, if you don't have a way to categorize and code that information, you may not see those broad trends. Um, so that's that's what I may submit about the first question. And as far as the second question is concerned, is the law simply too complex a con concept to be quantified? Right. And here, that's because social science research has very long been engaged in converting abstract uh, theoretical concepts into quantitative or empirical indicators. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the intelligence of an adult or a child is a complex, multifaceted reality. And yet intelligence quotient exists as, as an indicator of that reality. Um, the economic growth of a country is a complex reality. And yet GDP is an important measure of that growth that serves certain purposes. Maybe not all purposes, but it serves some purposes. So uh, no, the law is not too complex to be measured or quantified, but we have to be very careful about how we do so. And that's what I'm gonna to try to get at with this presentation. Um, so on the next slide, I address the very basic stages through which empirical indicators are developed. And there's two important stages. The first of these is conceptualization. Uh, as researchers who develop the index, uh, you do have to distill from a broad set of theoretical concepts into a specific formulation for the purposes of empirical work. And that includes within it certain choices that those researchers have made and the meaning that they have give, given that concept. So labor law may mean many different things to many different legal theorists or lawyers, but, but it means something specific as far as the CBR LRI is concerned. And the second stage is that of operationalization. And that means the creation of specific empirical indicators, the 40 indicators that Simon ran us through, uh, to reflect that concept that those researchers who are creating the index have stated. Um, so what this means is that clarity about these concepts is very important and it should precede the process of actually developing those empirical measures. So um, yeah, I'd just like you to hold on to those ideas of conceptualization and operationalization because we'll come to that later. Um, so on the next slide, um, we can go through and see very quickly the steps involved in index construction. And uh, here you see it starts with a broad concept, which is distilled into a specific, a specific statistical construct. So as it says on the slide, a statistical construct is a measure of the underlying reality called a concept, which the index is seeking to measure. And uh, that's an important idea. There's, there's the concept, the underlying reality, and there's the construct, which is the statistical measure. Um, and there are a few different elements that make up that statistical construct, and I'll go through them quickly. Uh, there are specific indicators, as Simon has said, there are 40 indicators that make up the CBR LRI. So this means issues such as, does the law or do the contracting parties determine the legal status of a worker? Um, is agency work uh, prohibited or strictly controlled or not? Uh, another element that goes into the creation of this construct is coding protocols. And Simon showed us those pro coding protocols on the screen. Um, they essentially would specify to the coders how scores should be assigned if a law says something or how it should be assigned if a law says something else. Uh, there's a measurement scale. In the case of the CBR LRI, that measurement scale goes from zero to one, and the coding protocol would specify uh, code zero if the law provides for something, or code 0 0.5 if it provides for something else. In the case of the CBR LRI, it's a graded scale, so in certain cases, there, there, there's some discretion for coders to provide uh, scores in between those. So you can have a score of 0 0.3 or 0 0.75, say. And then the last is the question of weighting and aggregation. And this just means how you would use your indicators to come up with a composite index. So there are 40 indicators in the CBR LRI, and you can take an average of those 40 indicators and come up with one number. You could aggregate them into the five sub-indices and then aggregate those five sub-indices. And uh, you could apply different weights to those sub-indices or indicators, and that will 
have to be determined by researchers on a case-by-case -case basis. If you have a priori reasons to think that something is more important, you would add additional weight to that indicator. So th those are the steps involved in index construction. And on the next slide, I would just like to make a few important caveats about index construction in general. So a composite index, a lexymetric index like this one, is a form of measurement, but it's not a very straightforward one. It's, it's not the same as measuring height or measuring weight. Uh, you're trying to measure the strength of worker protection, and that's obviously something very different. And one that, what that means is that this is data that is constructed. And when we say that data is constructed, we mean that certain choices have been made by the researchers who have constructed that database. And, uh, you know, th those researchers have had to face the challenge of converting a very abstract and theoretical concept like labor law into very specific concrete and measurable variables, the index and its various indicators. And that index construction has involved a process of making trade-offs. There's a trade-off to be made between the quality or the depth of the information captured by the index and its usefulness as, as a quantitative measure. And uh, I think that's a very important point here because there are certain standards and conventions generally accepted in social science research based on which we can assess uh, assess those trade-offs. Uh, was, was it a good call? Was it a bad call? Or you know, uh, are the trade-offs right or wrong? And these standards would tell us whether that index is a reliable, a valid and reliable measure of the concept that it says it measures. So I'll explain this in a little more detail uh, on the next slide. And, and this, this is the good part. So what, what are these standards and conventions by which we may justify making certain trade-offs in the process of coming up with these indicators, in the process of designing uh, the CBR LRI index? And the main standard used in social science research is that of construct validity. So construct validity is the issue of whether a measurement tool or an instrument um, in fact measures that which it is intended to measure. Measurement is considered to be valid when there's a good fit between that underlying construct that we talked about, the statistical construct, and the indicators that represent that construct. Validity involves a defense of how a concept as defined for the purpose it is being used for is transformed into empirical indicators. And this is not the same thing as engaging in broader theoretical debates about the abstract construct or concept itself. So let me uh, make this a little more concrete for you. Uh, Going, going to the next slide, um, because I think this is something very important when it comes to critically assessing an index like the CBR LRI. Um, and here there's a, there's a diagram. Uh, this diagram has been developed in a rather seminal paper that comes from the field of political science that addresses the very same issue of converting an abstract theoretical concept into empirical quantitative measures. And in the case of that paper, it was the concept of democracy, just like law, a complex, multifaceted, difficult concept to define. Uh, and yet there are lots and lots of political science quantitative papers that, that use quantitative indicators uh, to represent the notion of democracy. So if you think of the background concept here at level one, we can think of all the, the meanings in the universe that could be ascribed to labor law, all of legal theory, all of uh, all, all, all labor law theory itself, right? And when you think of the systematized concept at level two, you're thinking of the formulation of that concept by the scholars who have authored a particular index. Now, this is the process of conceptualization that we talked about earlier. Uh, Simon and his co-authors, as he, as he mentioned earlier, have conceptualized the CBR LRI to serve a very specific purpose. It's used to study the socioeconomic effects of labor law. So one, one way in which we might assess this index would be, has the CBR LRI conceptualized the idea of labor law that is fit for that purpose? And that means 
have they gone from level one to level two in a way that makes sense for the purpose that the CBRLRI says it will serve. And then uh, if we think of uh, level three, we're talking about the indicators that make up the index and level four, the scores that, that are assigned to those indicators. That's talking about the process of operationalization. Do the indicators in the CBR LRI uh, truly represent the concept that the CBR LRI is trying to capture? And what that means is when you're assessing the validity of the CBRI, CBR LRI as a measure, you're assessing it from level two to level four. You're not trying to say this is not a good measure of labor law because it does not represent every possible theory of labor law. Uh, and I hope I'm making that clear, but disputes about concepts must be clearly distinguished from the disputes about their validity, the measurement validity, and this distinction can circumscribe the arguments that we may meaningfully make when critiquing quantitative indicators. And like I said, uh, the, the concept is come up with for a specific purpose. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, I'll talk about what that purpose is in a little more detail when it comes to the CBR LRI. If we look at the CBR LRI from this perspective of construct validity, what do we observe? Um, and I'll try to be brief here, uh, but with this framework of conceptualization and operationalization, how does the CBR LRI conceptualize labor law? It conceptualizes labor law in a very specific way as the intended normative effect of a legal rule and not its actual impact on social actors. And this is a really important aspect of the index, I would argue, because as we've seen, the World Bank and the OECD have come up with their own indices and those indices have conceptualized labor law as introducing rigidity or strictness into the labor market. And the problem here is that your causal variable has to be quite distinct from your outcome variable. So you cannot really meaningfully ask the question, what, what effect does labor law have on the labor market if you're conceptualizing labor law as introducing labor <laughs> rigidity into the labor market. Does that make sense? Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's what's unique about the CBR LRI. The second uh, design choice of the CBR LRI that makes it unique is that it makes the strategic choice of constructing it exclusively on the basis of text-based analysis, legal analysis. And what that means is um, in this case, what that means is that it's trying to get to the intended normative effect of a, of a particular labor law, which is exactly what a labor lawyer would be able to tell you from text-based analysis. It's, it's uh, actually answering the question it, it asks in the first place. And the other pragmatic um, ad advantage that this has is that it allows for the construction of scores from earlier time periods and uh, this is important, um, Simon may mention it later, but it allows for a long time series. We have data from 1970 to 2023. And uh, on the other hand, if you try to operationalize these indicators by using coal-based or survey data, it may not be very reliable because you may have a different answer to those indicators depending on who you survey. So these are two really important design aspects of the CBR LRI that make it unique and that actually help it answer this question, really important question of construct validity. And I realize I'm running over time, so I'll go very quickly to the next slide. Uh, a, second, a second really important issue uh, at the stage of assigning scores is this concern about um, measurement being consistent, reliability. And what this means is, is that there should be consistency when the same phenomena are measured repeatedly using the same tools. This, is, this reduces subjectivity in the scoring process, uh, having clear coding protocols. And the CBR LRI has been coded by a group of researchers based at the CBR who have used the same coding protocol for multiple countries. You could argue that these lawyers don't have in-depth knowledge of the law, laws of all 117 countries, 
but they do have in-depth knowledge of that coding protocol. And what it means is that they can apply it consistently. And that's really important for data to be reliable. Um, on the next slide, uh, I just have to mention an, an important limitation of this, the, this approach. The CBR LRI explicitly captures an underlying conception of de jure regulation. And a meaningful assessment of institutions in relation to economic development means that we need an accurate uh, measurement of their function de facto. Therefore, the use of the CBR LRI only does make sense in econometric analysis, assessing the socioeconomic impacts of labor law when it's used in combination with uh, rule, uh, data on the rule of law, the, the World Bank's rule of law index, or um, indicators developed by Freedom House. And while this may be a limitation, uh, what, what it means is that we are able to separate out based on the CBR LRI, the effects of the law in the books and the law in practice. And uh, in conducting econometric analysis on the socioeconomic effects of labor law, this will always be a limitation. We will never have a very good uh, rule of law index for all countries in the world that tell us how laws are being applied in practice but there's no stated advantage or there's no advantage that we can understand to mixing up that effect in practice with that of the effect on the books. So with the CBR LRI, we are at least able to separate out those two issues and not mix them up into a single indicator. Um, finally, I think uh, I come to my last slide. And I leave you with one thought, which is uh, uncertainty and limited data should not cause us to abandon scientific, re scientific research. On the contrary, the biggest payoffs for using the rules of scientific inference occur precisely when data are limited, observation tools are flawed, measurements are unclear, and relationships are uncertain. And I think uh, the case of uh, the question of the socioeconomic effects of labor law, the construction of the CBR LRI, or any other labor law index uh, is, is exactly this. It's, it's, uh, it's difficult measurement, but its payoffs are high as well. And to effectively engage with the methodology with which these indices are constructed, I think it's important that we understand both the design choices that the authors of the CBR LRI have made, as well as the standards by which those choices have to be assessed or justified. And then we can engage in kind of meaningful engagement with this process to uh, dismiss legal indices because they do not, they're not accurate or perfect representations of the law uh, is not productive, but it also takes us down the slippery slope of dismissing intelligence quotient because it doesn't uh, capture every aspect of intelligence or dismissing GDP because it doesn't capture every aspect of economic growth. So I think that's something worth thinking about and it's useful to engage with this methodological question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Twisha. That was very thorough. And also uh, that lays a good groundwork for what I'm going to be talking about next, which is how can the data set actually be used? And uh, for that, I'm going to be sort of scanning through literature that has used the data set in the past to answer questions and explore correlations between labor laws, um, labor regulation with sort of different um, factors such as investment, unemployment, innovation, and this sort of, um, the research touches upon a lot um, more themes, which, I, and I think I'll be only be able to cover like a limited research, number of research studies given the time I have. Um, but we located around 20, at least 20, and I think there are uh, many more studies that have used uh, the CBR LRI and the earlier versions of it in the past. So regarding uh, the correlation between labor regulation and labor laws with investment, um, the first study was, the uh, one of the studies was uh, by Traverso and um, the team in 2021, which tried to explore the relationship between labor regulation and robotization which was basically measured through investment in automation. 
and the the findings of the study was basically they they used worker dismissal laws using the CBR LRI indicators to explore how that impacts uh, the investment of the firm or the investment attitudes of the firm, uh, which um, yeah, which uh, and and they found that it was um, the the higher the the most the stronger the dismissal laws of uh, a jurisdiction impacted um, impacted the investment risks of the firm and it made the investment riskier because of higher adjustment costs and um, it provided less favorable environments for firms to invest in robots and the correlation was actually caveated with a positive mediation by sectoral levels of capital intensity which actually another study confirmed. And while the other study found that industries with higher incident of sunk costs were more likely to invest in automation, uh, the result of that study was that labor-friendly institutions actually um, increase, um, increase the incentive of the firms to replace workers with robots simply because workers have more bargaining power in those jurisdictions to extract higher rents. Um, and that, of course, was um, dependent on, again, how, um, how it, capital intensive a sector was. And the study also found that while labor substituting capital was sort of preferred in those jurisdictions, it discouraged the use of labor complementing capital, which is basically that firms would be disincentivized to replace labor with more labor. Um, because of the higher extraction of rent by um, by human workers, but in cases where the capital was supposed to complement the labor, the, the, the incentives were not that high. Um, and that study also used a combination of indices to measure the labor-friendly institutions, which is a bit wider than the previous study, which measured uh, workers' dismissal laws. Um, and the combination of indices used include CBR, LRI is one of them. The, there was, again, and there have been a lot more studies on employment and unemployment, with one of them being um, Simon's paper co-authored, which, um, which, which measures the correlations of labor laws with unemployment and also its impact on labor share of natural, uh, national income. Um, this was part of the new thesis, sort of, which disagreed with the general consensus that deregulation increases employment. And this study, although did not found, did not find any consistent sort of relationship between labor regulation and in unemployment, it sort of um, concluded that with law, wherever laws were stronger for working time reductions. Um, it reduces it reduced unemployment and wherever laws protect protected worker representation there was sort of weak evidence to show that it improved productivity and un, um, reduced unemployment as well and um, overall the worker protective labor laws actually led to higher labor sh labor share and improved and therefore improved income distribution now this sort of new th so-called new thesis was sort of mapped in um, another study, which was sort of a meta-analysis of papers that have explored this correlation with employment and labor regulation, um, this study found that only 51, only 28 percent of the papers argued in favor of labor deregulation when it comes to growth of employment production and incomes, um, and 51 percent actually argued. 51 percent of the papers argued to the contrary, and this was based on 50 three papers that they analyzed between 1990 to 2019. Um, and it, it was, uh, yeah, so 51% of the papers actually argued against the consensus that deregulation increases employment. And again, uh, the paper, Simon's paper was one of, uh, one of the papers that actually um, is, is an example of um, the papers arguing against that consensus. Um, then the literature on innovation using the CBR LRI included a study where dismissal laws using the CBR indicator, CBR LRI indicators were um, sort of 
measured against the innovation that was for, that was uh, proxied for um, patents, citations, and number of filings of patents in in the U.S. And that study found that because of stronger sort of dismissal laws, the protection against uh, th there is protection against short-termist management, and also it in improves the internal governance of the firms, and all of that creates an environment that fosters innovation from the workers. Um, this was then sort of reiterated by another study, which uh, broadly, uh, which broadened the scope from dismissal laws to broadly employ regulation um, legislation, which positively affects innovation for the same reasons, because it, in it increases uh, firing costs for the firms. Therefore, it stabilizes the management internal, uh, going back to the internal governance argument, and then that leads to basically um, a, a sufficiently stringent dismissal law measured in the index led to sort of more stimulative, innovative working efforts by the employees because it increased the risks for adjustments and firing. Um, right. I think the, the broader sort of literature that goes uh, beyond these categories also touches upon shadow economies where the CBR indicators were used to measure the institutional capacity of which um, institutional capacity of um, of of uh, the yeah of the labor law frameworks and then the the uh, the impact on incentives to participate in formal work was measured which was higher and that reduced sort of the informal illicit um, shadow economies in those jurisdictions with stronger institutions. And the factors that were measured, that were used to measure the strength of institutions alongside the labor regulation were rule of law, bureaucracy, and corruption. And it was um, found that the, the way the labor law um, is designed in a country can either mitigate the effects of the stronger institutions on labor, on um, the formal work, or it can reduce or mitigate uh, the way the uh, labor rights affect the shadow sector. Another sort of study which actually argues a bit against that was um, the one which compared the effect of labor, labor regulations in global north and global south countries. And it argued that stronger labor, labor regulations actually amplified inequality effects in southern countries because global firms in the um, uh, in the north would usually util utilize the informal sector in the south to circumvent costs and to have uh, to get um, competitive leverage and that disempowered the labor in the global south and actually expanded the informal sector in the global south so there's clearly multiple ways to use the data to not just mark the impacts in particular countries, but also globally compare the effects of the same sort of labor regulation in sort of uh, global comparative ways. And finally, there were studies that actually, sorry, there were actually studies that used the index to, um, uh, to design further indexes. So there was um, the study of Levi and Turati, which actually constructed a new workers' protection index to examine the link between labor regulation and immigration. And it sort of indicated from the data of 70 countries that um, immigration actually affects the labor laws to shift in towards the protection levels of the origin of the immigrant labor, uh, immigrant worker. So um, clearly there are, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to use the data set in different ways to measure different um, economic variables, political econo economic variables. Um, and I think Luis is going to touch upon trends that we have noticed, which actually might feed into a lot more important research in future as well. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, yes, I'm Louise. I'm one of the teams that have been uh, working on the coding uh, for nearly 10 years now. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk about some of the trends. Um, 
So if we take a step back, look at the big picture. So obviously there's 117 countries, uh, but if we kind of condense that or average out all the countries, we can see there's a very steady um, increase over time since the 1970s. Um, but as you kind of take a closer look at different countries, different sub indices, and there are kind of different stories and narratives that emerge from that. Um, so while the, the general trend is upwards, you can see there are some kind of prolonged deregulatory episodes. So these four countries, Georgia, Ukraine, UK and New Zealand are prime examples. You can see all four of them have quite dramatic drops at certain periods. Um, and Georgia, United Kingdom and New Zealand, you can see they've recovered a bit, but none of them have quite got back to their, their former levels. Uh, Ukraine's an interesting one. So there's a big drop off um, the start of the invasion. Um, and obviously it's too early to see what, what will happen. Um, although a lot of those changes were actually proposed before the invasion, not that deregulation that was kind of ushered in as it was invaded. So it'd be interesting to see kind of longer term what happens um, with Ukraine. Uh, we've also got some outliers. So you can see, um, yeah, there's the, 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 the average and the, U, the USA is, is very interesting because it's, um, it's not just an outlier among uh, liberal democracies across, across, you know, it's well below everyone. <laughs> and uh, you can see Iran and Saudi Arabia kind of halfway between the global average and the USA, but it really is, is quite starkly below everyone else. Um, democratic transitions, you can just see on the graphs here um, the impact of those. So we've got four South American countries, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile and Brazil. When they had authoritarian regimes, you can see a big U dip um, that kind of marks that dictatorship or authoritarian regime. Um, South Africa is also an interesting one to look at. So in 1994, at the end of apartheid, you can see how um, labor regulation has kind of steadily increased from that point onwards. Again, in 2015, there was another increase in protection there. Um, East Asia, we can see quite quite big increases over time. So Taiwan, Vietnam, and China, you know, quite well below uh, the global average when they're starting out. Um, Japan's been a bit more steady with with more increases um, in latter years, but very definite trend, strong trend upwards for them. Um, and if we want to zoom in on a particular country, so with the UK, we've um, taking a look at the, the sub 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 indices. Um, for, for this country, just quite interesting. And then we've used, um, so I put EU, it's actually the, just Europe, um, the average of, of all the European countries, and um, just as a kind of benchmark to look how we're doing, um, kind of for comparison purpose. So there's different forms of employment. We've got, so yeah, looking at atypical contracts, part-time fixed and work. Um, you can see the UK has, has largely kept track with the EU and kind of converges in latter years. Um, so a very strong upward trend. Um, but look at regulation of working time, um, there's quite an interesting, you know, big dip and some recovery, but but still um, the UK is well below the European average. Um, dismissal uh, also tells an interesting story, kind of really increased um, the 70s and has been more steady and kind of declined a bit um, in latter years, sort of drawing away from, from the European average. Interestingly, I don't know if you can see in 2020 uh, onwards, um, during COVID, there was actually a little marked increase of dismissal protection. So a lot of countries um, either prevented firms from, from laying off workers during COVID or made it a lot harder to do so. So you can see there's a little uptick there, which is quite interesting to note. UK didn't, it kind of had other um, furlough options and, and there were quite a lot of interesting responses to that. but. Um, yeah, that you can see it on the on the European average quite distinctly. Um, so employee representation again, this tells a different story from the general upwards. Uh, or certainly in the case of the UK, you can see there's um, quite a large dip, um, and again, it's kind of some upwards recovery. But it is UK is well below uh, European average here. And again, industrial action right. So this is an interesting story. Um, the UK and, and European, they kind of swap positions. The UK started off higher and it's it's really taken some hits over the years, um, the 80s and 90s, um, recovered a little bit, but in latter years, 
you can see Europe as well, there's really been quite a, um, a dip in, in industrial action rights and protection in those areas. Um, so yeah, very, very interesting stories. As I say, there's kind of the big picture, all the data together, the trajectory is onwards upwards, um, but looking kind of close at different countries or different sub indices, you can see really quite distinct, different, um, different narratives um, and trends. And yeah, there's a lot more to explore and uh, we're excited to see what you find. And yeah, thank you very much. So just by way of conclusion, um, we're not presenting today any new econometric evidence. Um, that's work we're currently doing and we'll report on next year. But today we really want to introduce the new data set um, and explain what it can do. We hope it's going to be of, of general interest. Um, the empirical state of the art using the previous iteration of the CBR LRI has, as Bumika explained, not always come to a clear conclusion, but I think you would expect different, different results actually um, from the research community. We've looked at 20 or so studies which have used the data set um, in some detail. Overall, the data set has been cited um, several dozen times since it appeared last in 2017. So it's, we know it's actively being used by the research community. I think the dial is shifting a bit. Uh, the Blancaccio study, uh, the meta study shows that over time, more papers are being written, which take a nuanced view of the economic effects of labor laws from a position in the 1990s when there was really just one story going on. So we would say probably so far, we do see evidence that labor laws strengthen the labor share of national income. That's a fairly consistent finding. You would expect that. You would really hope that labor laws which protect workers improve their bargaining position relative to capital. Um, we do tend to see innovation and productivity effects, but they're quite complicated. They don't, don't always translate into higher employment. It's perfectly possible that more innovative firms uh, replace labor with capital um, and don't really replace labor with other labor. That, that's entirely possible. Um, we know from other work being done by the Digit Research Centre, however, that here in the UK, we know from the employer survey conducted by our Digit colleagues, that employment in high tech firms is going up. So technology is often associated with higher overall employment. So this is an interesting dynamic. Uh, we need to explore further, I think, whether labour laws which have a productivity or innovation enhancing effect always translate into higher employment. There may be other institutions which are playing a critical role here, so we need to, to, get, to get to that. Um, we do, however, I think see a nuanced situation, uh, maybe a shifting in the terms of trade in the debate, but we're not here today to argue for a particular conclusion to the debates about the economic effects of labor laws, but rather to say that with the data we've produced and created, we're hoping for um, an active debate as this goes on. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there and um, end the, the slideshow and hand back to Matthias, who's going to chair the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Sorry, no, I made a mistake. It's actually Ewan who's going to give his discussion point now. Yeah, I can, I can and Matthias is going to chair it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, but thanks a lot um, to, to Simon um, um, and uh, Trifka and Luis and Bumika for the very insightful presentation. We have now, let me just enlarge him in the screen here. Um, um, oops. We have um, Jung McGuffey here, who's, I guess, joining us from the other side of the world, if that's correct. Um, and uh, Jung is professor at uh, King's College London. Um, and yeah, also, I think, an associate of the CBR as well. So therefore, I would just, just say, Jung, the floor is yours. I don't know how much time you need, five, 10 minutes, I don't know how deep you want to go with your co comments or how tired you that are, fine. <laughs> the floor is yours. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ewan Megahi. Uh, I work at King's College London, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be with you. And uh, just, despite the backdrop here, I'm, I'm in Australia rather than uh, Amsterdam uh, because I'm on sabbatical. And uh, so I've, uh, it's, it's just coming up to midnight here. Um, um, if, if I fall off my chair, forgive me, uh, but I, I'm delighted to uh, join you for, um, uh, I, I think, a, a really interesting discussion about an incredible database. Um, and thank you to all the speakers before who have just given a, a, a superb summary. 
Um, I want to uh, per perhaps bring together three main things. Um, the legal importance of this database, uh, the economic importance, uh, and also the political uh, importance, um, and, uh, uh, and, and put forward some brief conclusions. Um, so I think the first thing is uh, how legally important this data set is. Um, so Simon mentioned that there are a quarter of a million, I think I heard right, a quarter of a million data points, uh, which is you know, a tremendous collection and a tremendous legal resource. Uh, if you look at the 2023 document, it's 855 pages. Uh, but but you know, what, what you've got to keep in mind, and I'm sure there's a lot of lawyers uh, here, is that you can go to this data set uh, and find you know a, a, any major country in the world or 117 countries likely uh, the country that you're looking for is in there uh, and get a pretty good summary of how their legal labor law system works on the five sort of uh, categories of labor law that it covers so uh, regulation of different forms of employment and working time and job security uh, and collective um, labor law as well. Um, so I, I think that's really important and uh, it, it means that you know going through very long textbooks uh, is made uh, much quicker um, and it, it's you know all in one place. I, I think it's a fantastic comparative resource. Matthias has actually written a, an article, if I remember rightly, on the death of comparative law. Uh, but 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 because now we can do quantitative analysis, and you don't have to go into the sort of qualitative complications. Uh, but you, you could see it that way. But I think that you can also see this as uh, a really big forward step uh, in comparative law. And, and of course, Matthias has been doing. Uh, very similar things for company law, and it's incredibly value, valuable. Um, and my only criticism of it there is that we uh, haven't got more of it. So, you know, more areas of law would be really, really interesting. Um, and uh, I, uh, But I just think that it's fantastic that it's been updated to this extent. Um, so second thing is the economic impact uh, of, of this database. Um, and I think Tuisha mentioned uh, uh, the OECD and perhaps the World Bank, uh, who also had done uh, similar kinds of uh, databases to evaluate the protectiveness of labor laws uh, around the world. Uh, and if you compare their work to this, they're, 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 well, there really isn't much of a comparison. Uh, the World Bank's data sets were notoriously riddled uh, with politically loaded errors. Uh, they discontinued that and it was going into the doing business report where uh, essentially they were putting the normative case that if you want to do business, uh, then it's easier if you have no labor laws. Uh, they discontinued that when uh, Obama came into power, uh, I, I think, uh, in the US uh, presidency. Um, the OECD also had a similar uh, data set uh, where it evaluated the protectiveness of different labor laws uh, around the world, but again, riddled with errors. I mean, I'll just give you two kind of funny ones that uh, I came across from reading it, uh, that they said that in the United States, workers don't get contracts, uh, which of course, every contract lawyer knows is, is nonsense. Even in America, they have pretty low protection, uh, but they still have a contract, even if it's not written. Uh, and they also said in the OECD data set that US and UK dismissal protection was very similar. Uh, and anybody who knows that the US knows it's uh, at will employment, unless you've got a collective agreement, uh, you can be fired for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all. And although UK dismissal protection isn't great, you still have a right to reasonable notice before a fair dismissal uh, and a uh, redundancy payment if you've been working um, more than a couple of years. Um, so, you know, other examples riddled by errors. And uh, th this data set is, I think, really um, making other attempts to do the same thing uh, push up their game. And uh, the, the, the empirical impact, uh, which uh, 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 has, was explained uh, before as well, I, I think the wonderful summary of different studies that have used this, uh, is, is super important because now that, you know, we've got this resource where laws are, you know, turned into, uh, uh, we can see the protectiveness go up and down and we can uh, put that into numbers. Um, the econometricians and, and sophisticated analysis, which uh, I wish I knew more about, 
um, it, it is capable of, of really showing what the relationship is between legal change and economic variables uh, like employment, like unemployment, like productivity, like innovation. Uh, and, and the kinds of studies that were summarized show a, a almost entirely the opposite of the standard narrative that we've had from sort of Milton Friedman uh, uh, and Friedrich von Hayek onwards, you know, the narrative that uh, rights kill jobs, or that unions cause unemployment, or that job security creates unemployment, uh, or, or that job security creates inflexibility, and, and that's bad for an innovative economy. Uh, you, you know, the sort of Friedmanite narrative uh, of, of economic theory, and it was always evidence-free theory, uh, was completely contrary to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Economic and Social, uh, social and Cultural Rights, uh, which says that everyone has the right to work or full employment, that everyone has the right to just and favorable remuneration, paid holidays to collectively bargain, uh, backed up with the right to take strike action if, if necessary. Um, so, you, you know, having a, a, an, an empirical, uh, empirically grounded um, econo economic uh, understanding of the world's labor laws is incredibly valuable to turn um, to, to turn the standard neoclassical uh, narrative uh, on its head, um, because really there is uh, now an, an emerging economics of human rights, or uh, as Mariana Mazzucato has put it in a recent article, uh, 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 an economics of the common good. Uh, you know, that's something that we can empirically ground. Uh, and that is a really game changing um, uh, uh, development. Um, and, and so the third thing is the political impact that the data set like this can have. Um, so, you know, for, for the reasons of law and economics, um, same reasons, uh, this is incredibly useful for civil servants who want to look at the impact um, of, you know, a proposed change on uh, on, on their economy, um, it's useful for think tanks, and it's also useful for trade unions. Uh, and I'll just give you one example that I've had recently while I've been in Australia. Um, the Australian Council of Trade Unions uh, was looking around for somebody to um, do, do a study of, uh, of European labour laws, particularly on the protection for agency workers. Uh, the Australian government is is uh, now the the, the Labour Party, uh, and they've got something called the Closing Loopholes Bill, uh, and they're proposing to uh, bring in a very very basic right of equal treatment uh, between agency workers and directly employed workers, um, and the mining lobby, the employers lobby, um, all all, all uh, screamed blue murder and, and said that you know if if you have an equal treatment right for agency workers, it's going to uh, kill the labour hire industry. It's going to damage the economy. Um, and, and very simply, the ACTU wanted to know if that was true based on the European experience. And, and what we can see um, uh, by looking at this data set, and this is what I've written in a recent report uh, for them, um, is that under uh, indicator A8 uh, in, the, uh, in the database, uh, which is whether agency workers have the right of equal treatment with permanent workers of the user undertaking, uh, we can see that among OECD countries, uh, Australia is the lowest in protection, i.e. has zero, along with um, New Zealand and, and the United States. Um, and even with the proposed reforms, it would be significantly lower in protection than uh, all EU countries and the UK uh, and other OECD countries as well, or comparable, it would go up to something like Japan. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the reforms in Europe didn't have uh, any kind of catastrophic consequence on the on the contrary uh, businesses welcomed it um so so that's just a, a an example just very small example of the political impact that uh, that, that this work and uh, uh, can have and how it uh, can be put to use um so i think you know overall in the broad picture the most interesting thing is how between the 2016 data set and the 2023 data set how protection has inched up i mean it's not dramatic uh, improvements, uh, but it, it is significant, and I think that that's important. Um, and, and I think that probably points to a sort of larger picture, which is that if evidence really does matter to policy making, uh, if evidence matters to policy making, uh, then we should probably continue to see uh, protection improve, uh, so long as policy is based on evidence and is determined by uh, more or less democratic polities. Um, that's a big if, but uh, I think probably one that most of us would like to believe is possible. Um, thanks very much uh, for listening and really interested to listen to the discussion.
many, many thanks. Uh, Simon, do you want to respond to it? Uh, it wasn't really questions, but further ideas, I guess, but yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Ewan. That's 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 really helpful. It it's um, interesting that the data set can be used, as you say, in these three different senses. Um, of course, um, it is a source of information about labour law, and you and I both know that the even in a one thousand page source book, the the information that we presented is comparatively uh, shallow and superficial. But of course, the data set can be used to point in the right direction and to lead researchers on to look in more detail at particular points. So I think it does serve a useful purpose. It's been fascinating to work on it this length of time and to get an impression of labor law evolving worldwide in this sense. So just as a researcher, um, it's been an interesting experience retrieving the laws, reading them. And then of course, what we're doing is benchmarking them against one another. This is not something which labor lawyers have been accustomed to doing, but when you begin to benchmark and you have to create um, coding protocols which facilitate this, I think you begin to see a pattern emerging and you can see things you couldn't see if you were just in a law library. So I think you're absolutely right at the level of comparative law, um, maybe this is helpful. Uh, it's a useful tool, isn't it? It's, that's what it is. Um, it doesn't in any way do away with the need for doctrinal conceptual research. And it builds on that, actually. Um, we're labor lawyers and we have this knowledge and expertise. That's what we do. The World Bank in its new um, post doing business report um, methodology, which is called Be Ready, which is now on their, on their website, replacing a doing business report, has a nuanced account of the theoretical debate. That's very welcome. And also the designers of the new uh, Be Ready indicators say that labor lawyers are the people they'll be going to for advice about how to code labor law because labor lawyers know about this. And I, th I think that is welcome. And I think that um, we'll probably never be at the stage where there's just one index. And I know you've also written about this, you and about the need for some sort of common understanding about what these scores might be. There will always be different approaches, I think. And maybe the World Bank and the OECD will have one type of approach and academic researchers will have a different approach. But I think that um, there's potential for all the indices to get better when there's some competition. It's no longer just one or two of them which are dominating the field. And of course, there are others, not just ours. Researchers have a choice. But I think I'm, I'm really pleased you said that the index is valuable for labor lawyers. I think it's also important for social scientists. And I suppose that was principally our audience. And we're working in a research center um, I, I've been a member of the Centre for 30 odd years. The Centre is coming to its 30th anniversary next year, so there have been 30 years of the research centre, and there's always been the possibility in the CBR of lawyers like me working with economists and sociologists and political scientists and others. And this is what the CBR has made possible, this kind of interdisciplinarity. Um, and much of the work we did uh, going back uh, 10 or 15 years, we did in collaboration with economists, uh, like Ajit Singh, who advised us from their point of view about what might be in the index. So this is to some degree their work as well. Um, we're trying to address an audience of social scientists who need to use data. They need to have data to do what, they, what they're going to do. It's really interesting then to see the presentation uh, Bumika gave just now and to read the part of um, the slides that she prepared, looking at these 20 studies and see how social scientists have been using them. Um, I think it's a really interesting process whereby we produce the data. We use it ourselves, of course, as, as Bumika explained, but many other people use it, which is really fantastic. That's the whole point. Um, and of course, this um, body of work is quite rich and quite nuanced. Um, I think we know more now, for sure, because of the data set and because of the work we and others have done to explore it econometrically. We, we obviously know more about how labor laws work. I think that must be the case. And I can say that because it's not just us doing the research, it's lots of other teams who are using the data. People write to us. A lot of people wrote to us to say, um, when is your new data set appearing? I'm glad to say it's finally appeared, which is just fantastic. And then policymakers. Um, we have received um, many requests from policymakers from time to time, we write reports for them. I think, again, you can see the tangible effect on labor laws in some countries, not just of the econometric results. Now, econometric results can always vary a bit and you'll have um, lots of different outcomes, perhaps from different studies using different methods. Um, so social science is like all science. It proceeds incrementally, doesn't it? We're testing a hypothesis. We might reject parts of it. We might confirm others. There may never be a completely settled view on this question. So policymakers are often interested not just in the econometric results, which are, of course, compelling at one level, but also in the benchmarking process. As you say, um, it's really interesting to hear that the data set can be used in the Australian policy context.
People want to know how laws compare to one another, right? And now you have a method for at least getting at some approximate understanding of that. That's really valuable. Is labor law in the US and UK, are they really the same? Obviously not. Okay, but on the OECD index, the US and the UK are right down at the bottom for employment protection. Uh, Turkey is right at the top and the OECD employment protection in index and only halfway up ours. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, and maybe it's good to have alternative measures if people understand how the measures were constructed. I think that's the issue. Um, so it's very, very encouraging that the data set has been used. Um, and of course, we would very much like it to be used. Um, so I'm so pleased that um, around 60 people have joined the call um, this afternoon, and there were about 15 or 20 of us here in the room. This is just fantastic, because the aim is to get the data set out there and to get people using it. And we look forward to receiving, of course, feedback on it from all those present and those who may use it. Thanks very much, Ewan, for your really helpful advice. Stay. Yeah, stay yeah, here. Like, um, I'll, I'll stand here. Yeah. You can just do it because now we get to the uh, part um, about the QA. Perhaps, Simon, if you go there and let's just ask, I'll, I'll take my laptop. Um, if there are questions in the room or online, I see one question already online. Questions in the room? Um, I have questions, I should admit, but I. Uh, I will leave others first. So then we have, I think, the first one online. So that, uh, Greg? Yeah, then. Oh, th oh, thank you very much, uh, Simon and colleagues. Uh, I'm also in Australia. Can you hear me okay over yes, there? Can. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. And I, uh, I agree with you in that this is a really tremendous project with a superb data set and congratulations to everyone concerned with it. Um, I got a, a couple of uh, questions to, to raise for, for discussion, and one relates to the uh, point that I think uh, Tavisha made um, about the de jure and the de facto aspects of labour law, because as we know, there are many labour laws that are not really enforced very effectively, and the enforcement varies a great deal. Some countries, some jurisdictions are good at enforcing the labour laws and some turn a blind eye completely. And I wonder if or to what extent you've been able to uh, consider that de jure, de facto uh, distinction. And, and a second related point is how you deal with federal systems like the US, for example, and India, indeed Australia, where there are um, different laws, different regulatory regimes and different degrees of enforcement in different parts of the same country. And, uh, and these are meant to be friendly and constructive uh, comments. I'm not in, in any way trying to... Uh, attack what, what you're doing and indeed you've really motivated me to try and dig into it further I'd like to use it a, a great deal but my, my, my last comment might be about the uh, the trends that uh, I think it was your third speaker mentioned about the protection base uh, inching up but at the same time we've seen a massive increase in inequality, which uh, I wonder how you might explain the the gradual increase in protection on the one hand, uh, employment protections and so on, but on the other hand, this huge increase in inequality that we've seen in many countries around the world, particularly in the liberal market economies, the Anglosphere, if you like. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Greg, really, really helpful. So first of all, on enforcement, um, we would like to be able to, to measure enforcement. There may be a case for a separate enforcement index one day, uh, but we have to rely upon other measures, for example, of the legitimacy of law in a country. The World Bank's Rule of Law Index is often used, or the World Justice Project, but that only goes back maybe a decade. So the World Bank Index goes back quite a long way. Freedom House is often used as a measure of the enforcement of human rights law, which might include labor law. Uh, Freedom House is used because of a very long time series that, that, that people can use. So it's partly a question of finding the right index on enforcement, which can be used with ours, and we can control for enforcement, maybe deflate the score 
What's difficult, I think, is that um, we know that there's, it's really hard to measure enforcement as such because there are many countries where there are very few employment uh, cases a year, very few cases going to court, very few employment tribunal cases in countries like Sweden and Japan, for example, where we know there's a high level of acceptance of the law. So you can't measure enforcement by just looking at the number of claims or the size of the uh, labour inspectorate in the country. Right? It's really tricky to measure it in that sense. Um, so we know that there are countries in the middle range, like the UK, France, Germany, where there are quite a lot of employment tribunal cases everywhere, uh, every year. China and South Africa, very large numbers of cases now going to labour arbitration commissions in China. Because of China's size, it probably has more employment cases now than anywhere else in the world, everywhere else put together even. OK, it's quite interesting. But South Africa has a very active um, uh, labour adjudication process, a lot, hundreds of thousands of cases being heard each year really complicated to get at enforcement. Um, mm. So we can, in a big panel data study with over 100 countries, you'd want to control for enforcement by looking at the indices which are available. For a country study, um, you may or may not want to control for that because within a country, maybe over time, uh, the rule of law doesn't vary all that much and maybe the judicial system hasn't changed all that much. So I think the, the nice aspect of having a measure that's purely a measure of labor law is that you might want to use a control sometimes and not on, on other occasions. So you have that flexibility, I think. But I fully agree with you. We, we, we do need an enforcement index. Maybe that's our next job. Although since this one took nearly 20 years, I think we might be running out of time a little bit for some of us. Um, <laughs> on the issue of um, your, 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 your second question, I think was about federal systems, right? Now, um, I'm gonna say, Greg, if you look at this, the source book, which is now online and the earlier versions, then you can see an explanation of this. Now we try to get around it by saying, um, we might look at a particular um, state or province and take the score there. We've done that for complicated countries, very complex countries with multi-levels like uh, Canada in particular. Um, to some degree, you can say, well, if it's a national picture you're looking at, let's say you've got national data on GDP, employment, productivity, you, want to, you need to get a national measure somehow. Okay, so you, you're, you're trying to do your best uh, to deal with this problem. Um, you might look to the law in Ontario. For the US, you might go to New York or California. But even there, we thought, well, even if in California, employment at will is being qualified, we're still, going, we're still not going to increase the score, you know, because we just think American dismissal law is so weak. But the famous study by Acharya, where they looked at US states, they also cited our paper for their cross-national study. They looked at California specifically, didn't they? And Massachusetts, which were high-tech states, and they, they, they saw bumps and kinks in the law about employment at will. It got a bit stronger, and they found that strong, strengthening workers' dismissal rights, rights to protection against arbitrary dismissal, again, were correlated with more innovation and more employment in high-tech firms. Really interesting study. So it's it, it partly a question of, which type of econometric study do you want to do? Okay. Um, why do we see inequality increasing if labor law is strengthening? I, I think, we, I think what, we, what we're saying is that there'd be even more inequality if labor laws hadn't been strengthening, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the labor share goes up when labor law gets stronger, but in many countries, there's been a secular decline in the labor share. Now, why is that? Uh, one factor we didn't talk about today, but on another occasion we would do, is that we've got data on shareholder rights as well. And this is the index which Matthias uh, developed um, with Priya Lely and others uh, when, when our project began and which we're in the course of updating. Now that index shows a very dramatic rise in shareholder rights over, over the period of this labor index, uh, counterbalancing, if anything, the, the, the worker protections we see. A fall in the extent of collective bargaining, well, um, a yellow Vissa's collective bargaining index, which the OECD has now taken over, um, shows obviously big declines in collective bargaining coverage in many countries. Although this says there isn't really a correlation between collective bargaining getting weaker and labor law getting stronger. So he rejects the idea that labor laws are substituting for collective bargaining. But I think the answer to your question, Greg, is um, things would have been even worse without labor protection. I, th I think that's what we'd say. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much. And I know it's really challenging and very difficult to actually get into the practice of implementation because not only does it differ with, within countries but it did, differs from time to time you know some republican federal jurisdictions federal governments in in the u.s tend to take money out of the enforcement uh, process whereas democrat governments under democrat presidents tend to build it up again and, and so forth but thank you very much and good luck with it all for your question um, okay.
then it's me again. Uh, questions from the audience here in person. Um, perhaps I can ask two or three questions, uh, more for clarification, I guess, to Simon and the team. Um, do you have 117 countries? You know, like when you may talk to economists, they would immediately tell you, we want all the countries of the world. The which countries are missing? And do you have some where you felt like you really wanted to have them, but you really couldn't get the data or the information or it was perhaps not feasible or reliable or there were complexities involved? Um, and then I think also perhaps some people who like data would say, what about going back further in time? Because we always started 1970 in the first project, but there were also some studies now that have said, yeah, we want to go about 100, 100 years back, really like a long time series that gives us also like perhaps deeper means to understand how, how the law evolved. Um, and then uh, that can be also the question whether that's feasible with the current index, or perhaps if we wanted to have a longer time series, but the current index, maybe in this regard, to modern in the sense, because the, the, the way you choose variables may reflect on also the, th the things uh, that are happening in today's world. And I think there actually we have a, um, a question in the chat as well, by someone on platform work. So that's um, something perhaps we can also, uh, in this regard, um, discuss. So there's a question here by Luciana Dotzoli, I think from Essex, if that's correct. Um, thanks for the fantastic presentation. In the commentary, you highlighted that platform work in numerous countries progressively aligns with traditional employment regulations. Um, could you provide further insights and elaborate on this trend? So like these recent trends in, in, in I guess, labor work and practice. No, thank, thanks very much. Maybe I can answer your, your, your questions first, yeah. Matthias, before answering uh, Luciana's. Um, so first of all, why only 117 countries? Uh, it's quite difficult to retrieve the laws of some countries going all the way back to 1970. You might think it's, it's obvious where the laws are, um, but actually statutes, and mostly this is legislation, of course get repealed, and often uh, the only place you'll find old statutes might be a very special type of law library, like the one here in Cambridge, or the, the Ur Law Library of the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg, which has everything, um, historical and comparative, maybe the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London, uh, lawyers who are practicing now don't need statutes in the 1970s, and these books were never digitized, and they're thrown away. It's difficult to go back in time, uh, even if we know what the law currently is. In some of the countries we don't code, it's tricky to go back a very long way. Maybe with the help of a labor law expert, you might do. But again, former Soviet Union countries have a particular problem there, because a lot of that knowledge has, has been lost or has gone. So it is some of those countries that we'd like to code, but haven't yet coded. We, we use the ILO's NATLEX database to source most of the laws and if we can't find a law there, and we know it exists, it will go online. Um, often there are sources online. Um, we can go to the law library if we're really stuck. So we'd like to code more, but there's a, a data issue for some of the countries. And of course, going back even further would raise, would, would raise this problem again, I think. 95% of world G GDP is not bad, and the only countries not covered are actually those with probably some patchy legal coverage anyway. So in theory, you'd like to code all 300 plus, but again, the point about a data set like this is there are clearly diminishing returns at some point from the extra effort you put into creating it. We have to be realistic. A lot of time and effort goes in already to creating the data set. And at some point, like all other processes of data construction, uh, the, the costs might outweigh the benefits. But we're absolutely open to extending it in future. Um, on on the, um, the issue, oh, sorry, your second question? Uh, yeah. Going back in time. Yeah, yeah, going back in time. So, so again, um, uh, the... Uh, uh, data set that's been created at, at uh, Bremen University goes back further. They're going back initially, I think, to about 1960, Heiner Feschner and his colleagues, Irene Dingleday, Ulrich Schmuckenberger. They're going back in time. Um, and they want to go back in time a lot, a lot, a lot further too, back to the 19th century. Um, to do that, in our case, would mean rewriting the coding protocols and choosing different indicators, because obviously what's, what's law in about 1970 is pretty much the types of law you have today. In 1970 already, you have unfair dismissal law coming in in many countries. You have strike law going back longer, of course. Working time standards in South America, the 1910s, Uruguay, 1915, France, the 1930s. Okay, so you can go back for some types of thing. Unfair dismissal law, you're not going to get anything much before 1970 for most countries. There might be one or two only. So I think you'd have to redesign the index somewhat. Okay, so the, we're very happy that our, our Bremen colleagues are doing this. Now, they're going to go back further. That's, that's completely fine. So there may be no need for us to do it if they're doing something that we, we, we could have done. There's absolutely no problem 
with people using our index, they partially use ours and they may adjust it or, or change parts of it. No problem with that either. I mean, many people altered the famous Laporta codings if they weren't entirely convinced by them. And you can take our index and say, well, if I don't agree with the score for a particular country year, maybe I'll change it. Because at least I understand how these researchers did it. So I hope we're really transparent about how we did it. And there's obviously scope for a bit of disagreement on some of the scores, although we try our best to be objective. Um, but if a researcher doesn't like our score and thinks it's wrong, they can, do, they can do it differently using our methodology or maybe change our methodology. Right? We can deepen our index to look at platform work. So to start addressing Luciana's question, you could take parts of the index already, uh, and they refer to uh, platform work um, in some sense or another. So the first part of the index on so-called different forms of employment, part-time work, temporary work, to some degree, those are issues, those are label or topics which affect platform work. The definition of the employment contract, employment status, do delivery riders have uh, LIMBY worker status or LIMA employee status? That's the kind of thing we code for already in variable one. Rights of gig workers who work part-time or on fixed term contracts might be affected by existing rules. So to some extent, we are already capturing regulation of platform work and the whole index is relevant to platform work insofar as some gig workers might be workers or employees. So the, the overall index clearly affects the gig work sector in some sense. But then there are laws which are specific to gig work, which we don't code for. So Louise and I are at the moment working on a separate index that will deepen the analysis of platform work. So we might begin with variable one and try to deepen it. As I say, at the moment, the, the, the index by definition doesn't go as deeply as a labor lawyer would if advising a client or writing a conceptual piece. I admit the data set's shallow at this level, but very, very broad. It's really, really broad, but inevitably a bit shallow. There's a bit of a trade-off. I think we have to accept that. So you can deepen it and you can use the same methodology to do a, a deeper dive into a particular area of law. Let me code in more detail decisions on platform work and, and leave the rest aside. Let me look in more detail at rules about algorithmic governance, which are not yet part of the index and which are quite new. So we already code for things like the Uber judgment in the UK, the Spanish riders law, uh, the judgments in countries like France and the Netherlands about worker status, the Chinese guidance on gig work. That's in there, but we're deepening it to produce what we think is gonna be a richer, more nuanced account of what's going on with gig or platform work. So I, I think that's the answer. I hope that's the answer to your question. The claim that we're seeing some trends already, that's in the data set insofar as we can track them. We can see uh, this general trend operating on the laws governing the definition of the employment contract that absolutely fits into platform work. So when we say we think platform work is becoming more intensely regulated or normalized, what we mean is we see a bit of an uptick in the overall score, which is reflect, a reflection of court decisions saying that platform workers are workers or employees. Okay, Ireland, the UK, Netherlands, France, to some degree, um, China, you look at Australia, you see the opposite, okay? So you see already there's a bit of an uptick in most countries. That's what we talk about when we say normalization. These are really decisions which accept the legitimacy of platform work, but they begin to regulate it by applying some, not all, labor law rules to platform work. Uh, the right to the minimum wage, the right to working time, sometimes the right to collective bargaining, although not as of two weeks ago here in the UK after Deliveroo, but that's just one ruling actually. Okay, so when we say normalization, I think we see a dual strategy that platform work is becoming legitimized through this process, but also incorporated into some labor law protections. That's exactly what happened with part-time, fixed term and temporary agency work beginning 30 years ago. This normalization process cuts both ways. Uh, to some degree, there's, there's an alternative to the standard employment contract, but it's also a validation of the standard employment contract because very often there's a right to equal treatment with uh, full-time employees up to a point, right, okay. So this normalization process we hypothesize is beginning for platform work, just as it did for part-time, temporary and fixed-term work. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Australia's one, um, last week's delivery judgment or a fortnight ago in the UK, a bit of a step backwards, although case law is like this, you know, it, it comes and goes. Um, uh, of course, there are some platform workers who will be independent contractors. Yeah, if, if you're working on Amazon Turk and you have lots of clients, it is genuinely maybe a platform, but if you work for Uber, Uber runs a taxi business and you may well be uh, a worker. Or in Ireland, after the Karshans case of a fortnight ago there, um, delivery riders are employees okay, uh, and treated as such by tax law. Right. Okay, so we see different countries moving around this kind of equilibrium around what are the rights of these workers. Um, 
it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. So you see lots of experimentation and labor laws like this, it evolves in this way and eventually it, it may settle down. So that's, that's what I think is going on with um, platform work. And I think we'll, we'll deepen this analysis next year when we have a bit more time. Um, further questions, comments from the audience uh, online, on person, here in person. Perhaps you could introduce yourself as well. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Julian, a PhD student, PhD candidate here in Cambridge. I, I one or two questions regarding uh, Louis' uh, presentation, especially on the um, first would be on COVID. It's quite striking that you could expect more or less, uh, I mean, a kind of disruption during COVID, but except this small difference, I think, on dismissal protection between the EU and the UK, there's not much actually. It's difficult to see that we experience a pandemic if you just look at the graphs. So I don't know if we have a bit of a already granular explanation on what, what, why, why it's a reason for not noticing any strong disruption uh, during COVID. And the second one is on Ukraine. Uh, the, the massive drop uh, is quite interesting. It's not necessarily due to the war because it started apparently a bit before. And uh, it's also, that's not really a question, but it's more... The, uh, in terms of agreement between Ukraine and the EU, where there's a need for, for Ukraine normally to align on, uh, on, on EU law, including the labor law. So it's quite interesting to see this, this massive drop. And I don't know, I, I guess we don't, we don't know much yet, as you said, about, about this, but that would be interesting to follow. Thank you. Um, so the first question was about COVID and um, you're saying that it was just mostly dismissal law that was affected. And so were you asking why other areas aren't affected or why it was not more evident or? Yeah, I mean, even dismissal law, it was not, well, the difference between UK and you was not massive, but in general, in the graphs, there's no, there's no strong, strong. Yeah, so, um, so get that slide. Screen share. So, yeah, so this is the slide here. So, I mean, it, it, it's not a huge, huge thing, but this here. So that in the kind of 20s, the COVID impact, and again, because it's average, not every country did it. I think it was, um, I'm trying to think of my head now, Germany, Spain, Spain. Yeah, I think Spain was like, you can't lay off anyone. So, I mean, this is, I think, 20 something countries. Yeah, so th there's quite a few countries. So obviously it's not gonna show a, a, a huge, um, but yeah, I think that there's kind of a blip yeah, obviously it's not a huge spike because it's not every country and it's just some but there are enough countries that you can see across um a bunch of them that there is a little uptick there and then i think from about 2022 they often revert to how it was before so yeah it's it's not a dramatic increase but it does register on the european average it's easy to understand what you get started because it's a single country what i was was, was i'm sorry for appearing us it's yeah. more that's if you take all the graphs you have seen, it's, it's difficult yeah. to see actually um, a disruption in terms of so not this, this small, small difference here. Yeah. But in, in general, when we really take the 2020, 2022, mm -hmm. it's difficult to see any, there's no any major disruption on, on, on the other graphs. No, yeah, I, I think dismissal law was, was I mean, so in some countries, um, so working time's another one where we did see changes in law, but usually it was sector specific. So it would be like doctors, emergency services. And we saw quite a few countries were saying, uh, removing, so I think like France is quite a strict, I don't know if they, I can't remember specific because we didn't code these because they were just, it wasn't the whole country. It was usually just emergency services, but basically they lifted off the caps and they said, if there's like a 30 hour limit or 40 hour, you know, because there's a, a national crisis, um, you know, we, we are going to allow longer, basically remove that protection where there normally is. So yeah, it's it, it, it's one that 
we, we did we did see we did notice and it but it's not captured on our data set just because it didn't cover everyone it was only limited to emergency service and we thought well we can't so this is the case for the whole country. But yeah, I agree. It's one way you, it would be interesting to see that kind of impact. But yeah, it, Simon and I did have this discussion. Do we include this? Don't we? You know, it's only emergency areas or um, food delivery drivers or something. It was, yeah, it, it's one way, you, yeah, as you say, you might expect to see. I think that there is. Even the, even the overall curve is quite, is quite regular. There's no, the, the, for all countries, the, the one which shows from 70 to 2022 is very regular. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that's, that's all of them. so it kind of looks, it looks straight. So yes. you're missing out on all the variations because it's 100 mm. countries. Mm. So it, it just looks more, more straight and general than, than it really is. At country level, you see massive changes. So of yes. course, the satellite eye view um, and these averages, even, even for Europe, don't fully capture what happened during COVID. Mm -hmm. But in the data commentary, there's more detail. Yeah. That's uh, published online today by the Digital Research Centre. So you can see there are some countries where they, they strengthened dismissal law, but loosened um, some aspects of work time law. So you could work for longer, but it's more difficult to be dismissed. One country, I think, imposed strike law restrictions. Right? Many countries like the UK and the US use tax law and social security law rather than employment law mm -hmm. to deal with COVID. So they handed out subsidies to employers in the UK. They massively increased social security spending in the US. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the US, the Trump administration has a social security measure that's paying higher than the minimum wage, really, to millions and millions of people. Quite extraordinary. But countries have different ways of dealing with COVID. What we suggest in the data commentary is that dismissal law um, is not being treated as a, a, a constraint only in this situation. It has a useful public purpose of stabilising employment in some countries. And this is a, a very different way of thinking about it from, of course, the way that people thought about it 20 years ago. So the Ukraine, we understand that the measures which were just introduced uh, in 2022 or so were being planned before the uh, conflict with Russia began. So in that sense, although they're brought in under the wartime emergency, it, it, they are also clearly uh, endogenously generated by a political debates inside Ukraine about what kind of economy they, they wanted before the conflict and the kind they want afterwards. Right? So it's very similar to Georgia, and some of the same politicians were involved in advocating for these changes, as were making the case in Georgia as well. Although, as you see from the chart, uh, Ukraine is still um, in a little bad. It's still got more protective labour laws than many countries, including the UK. So they have gone down from this rather protective post-Soviet law. Yeah, uh, something in the chat? Sure, I can quickly go. Sure, we have two points. May I? Yeah, up there. So we have, first of all, um, here, Gemma was linking to us the digital uh, data commentary that's there on the on the link here for people interested and it possibly pops up also if people want to Google. And then a question, um, Eleanor Kirk, uh, who uh, I think is at Glasgow, fantastic talk and research, that's nice. Uh, I can't wait to look at more closely, I'm transitioned so I can't turn on my camera, but I'm interested in thoughts on the political traction or lack of it thus far. If policy make, makers take note, I guess of our index and Simon, Eddie. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, so I, I think there has been some impact, um, not, not in the UK, but elsewhere. Um, we were in touch with policymakers in several countries. Um, people used the data, got in touch with us. The main impact was with international agencies. We prepared data for the uh, Asian Development Bank, uh, largely for econometric analysis. Uh, we prepared data for the ILO, um, again, largely for research purposes, but um, a related index the ILO was producing on collective labour laws, which is doing a similar job of benchmarking laws in a slightly different way, but somewhat more descriptive. The reason I worked on that um, around a decade ago. We, we know that the uh, benchmarking of labour laws is useful because um, the ILO were able to tell us that it had been very useful when it came to giving advice to a number of countries about labor law reform, including Vietnam, when it introduced recently laws on collective bargaining and industrial action, which introduced a freedom of association right for the first time really in that country. It's still in many ways an ex-socialist or socialist economy with um, really 
uh, state control over trade unions. So introducing freedom of association laws was important in Vietnam. I guess Ewan has just explained how maybe this benchmarking process can work in, in the context of the Australian debate. In the EU, uh, well, again, I think more agencies within a European setting have approached us for data. So I think at this level, the data feeds into a process of learning about labor law. It doesn't necessarily produce a direct change, but the econometric analysis might do, because that's really addressing the question, are labor laws harmful or not? Um, now, that econometric evidence base is growing all the time, um, and we, we contribute to it, and so do other people. So I, I, I would very much hope that as time goes on, that the dial shifts a bit, um, and policymakers are no longer just um, referring back to the 1990s, early 2000s work on how labor law works, and they see these multiple effects. And you need a very frank discussion with them about whether productivity will or will not lead into higher employment. So that is the next step for us and other people to do more analysis of the data um, at a time when uh, labor law reform is coming back onto the agenda in many countries for various reasons. Um, I think some disenchantment with the Washington consensus after the global financial crisis, some disenchantment with the EU's emphasis on jobs at all costs from the 1990s, the OECD's jobs report, we no longer hear the OECD saying exactly what it was saying before. So I think in that sense, there should be an input. But of course, I would say that uh, what drives labor law reform, I, I understand this very well, is ultimately interests and to a large extent ideologies. Um, we have tried to present a social scientific account of labor law, which is data based and rooted in uh, the best we can do in terms of statistical analysis. What drives legal change in labor law as elsewhere, company law, is in the, in the immediate term, interests and the ability of groups to lobby for the laws they want changed in a certain way. Um, and we have to accept also in political terms, ideology, labor laws inescapably an ideological area. I do find it difficult sometimes as a researcher uh, for, uh, to, to, to be heard. Yeah, it's really hard for our voice to be heard when so much of this is driven by interests and ideology. So we have to do our best to say, this is interesting evidence. We think we should take this seriously. We do our best to diffuse it, but we shouldn't be naive about the obstacles here. And of course, ultimately, I also understand these are political matters and cannot be decided alone by reference to what you might think is a somewhat technocratic understanding of labor law. We know this. When I worked a good, okay, well over 20 years ago, um, when the CBR was younger, um, in the early days, we did a lot of work on company law and the Labour government had a company law review going on all the way through the 2000s. At a very early stage, we wrote a report about director's duties with a lot of empirical evidence in it. And um, um, a, a, mem a member of a, a, an employer's organisation said to me, this is really, really interesting, but at the end of the day, it's interests which decide politics. Right? You know, and I think this is probably correct. Are there further questions? So we got uh, also feedback from Eleanor now, who's happy <laughs> with the response. Further questions from the room or online? Um, we, we... I had a question. Actually. Ah, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering to what extent the index is looking at coverage or intended coverage, like you were saying as well, like with platform work and different types of contracts, different types of workers, uh, what percentage of workers are being covered or what types of workers are being covered, how is that? That's right, so you, there is evidence on how many workers are in the so-called formal economy in, in, many, in many countries. Um, so that might be one measure of how many workers are in principle covered by these laws. But it could be that workers fall outside the scope of the law because they don't have an employment relationship. Or it may be that they're within the formal scope of the law but because of enforcement problems, they never get access to any rights. So the notion of formality and informality is I think really complex at that level. And even informality has more than one meaning and there's more than one way to measure it. So informality is measured in a specific way, for example, in India and in China has traditionally not been measured at all, although there are ways to get at a measure of it. It's really difficult to estimate how many workers are protected in principle. You could deflate the scores by uh, data on coverage. And some people have tried that. So the Monash Index um, uh, developed um, by, by some of our colleagues there deflates some of the scores by reference to what is known about coverage. Now you can do that if you want a kind of descriptive measure 
which is a mix of the formal dual law and how the law works in practice. That might give you a, a certain descriptive measure, um, but it may not be so valuable for what we're trying to do principally, which is an e econometric analysis, um, where it might be important to keep those variables separate. You, know, you might use one to control for the other. So enforcement data where it exists, coverage data can be a control in an economic regression. Again, it depends which country we're, we're, we're talking about. So I think all these things are possible with the data set, even if the data set itself doesn't give a, a complete answer to them. It should help people get a better understanding, I think, of the problem. In India, the latest codings discuss in some detail, the, for example, the debate there about informality, who's covered by the, uh, the contract um, labor um, Adjustment Act, um, Abolition Act, Contract Labor Abolition Act. So we discussed that and who falls under that. And we also code for the recent changes made to Indian labor law, but not yet introduced. So this is kind of perspective coding. They've been enacted, but not, not brought into force in many states. So in countries where there's a debate about formality and informality, the data set might be useful, not just India, South America as well. Um, where actually, again, informality has all, all kinds of complex connotations. Um, other questions? Um, we, it was scheduled until two, but I think we've uh, we've done enough. Uh, first of all, then um, I would like to thank, obviously, um, the speakers, um, also the uh, authors of the paper, um, and the Digit Center and the CBR, and thank also the ESRC, which provides the funding um, for uh, supporting this project. Um, so I would just say, say thank. Let's thank everybody the usual way, and yeah, have a good afternoon. Thanks very much. Everybody.